Hey everybody, James Jaco Type Response. We've got Chris Barrett here today. We are at the, the world famous Barrett Manufacturing Facility here in, uh, in Middle Tennessee. And Chris is gonna kind of take us through the factory and show us kind of how things are made here. We're, we're really excited about this, man. There's a thousand questions and, and I know you're gonna answer a bunch of them. I'm excited about it. I All love right. what we do. Let's go. These, uh, these weights to work out with, Chris? <laughs> they might be. This is the uh, barrel cell. So every barrel for every Barrett rifle is made here from rifle blanks. Right here? Right here on these three machines. Uh, a couple other little ancillary machines we have on the side, but you know, the beauty of this thing, this cell and this manufacturing process set up this way, is we can start in the morning with a, a barrel blank, and these are 50 cal blanks, so they're kind of, uh, they're kind of stout. But in a few hours, that goes from yeah, rifle blank to actual completed barrel. So we kind of have a lot of flexibility on what we make that day for a specific model. But more importantly to us, we have complete control over every operation that happens to that barrel from chambering, threading the muzzle in, threading the chamber in. We keep everything super straight. Now, over, over the years, we've talked about barrels a lot, the yeah. difficulty yeah. with making barrels and flowing chrome and, and different yeah. things, that, different ways that barrels are made. So you guys, do you feel like you've got a pretty good grasp on it now? We, I'd say we have absolutely nailed it. It is, it is the biggest reason why every rifle that Barrett makes shoots the way it does. And when I say that, I don't just mean rifles that we expect to shoot good, like an MRAD, the sniper rifle systems, but like our hunting rifles, our Rec 7 carbines, we, nothing we make shoots over an MOA in any of those rifles. So awesome. it's, it, it was very important to us. We wanted to build rifles, barrels, the way a custom gunsmith builds them, but instead of one at a time, you know, several a day or a hundred a day. Right. So we, we think we've really got that process mastered. Fantastic. What are these? Those they are, are <laughs> these are uh, these are actually barrels for the new Fieldcraft hunting rifle. So you know, one of the smaller, lighter barrels we make, even our hunting rifle barrel, we thread for a suppressor, right. which is a great idea. But um, this rifle shoots incredibly well. You can see the quality of the chamber in there. I mean, yeah. Wow, I'm even yeah. impressed this morning. <laughs> that's like really good. That is really good. And um, you, you know, that's the difference you get between some typical production rifles. They don't all have this level of care in them. This is gunsmith, one-off build quality in a production setting. Fantastic. I put that in backwards. Oh man, that, that guy <laughs> will flip out if he sees Dude, that. I This cell makes a lot of similar parts. You know, we do, we're not such a high volume manufacturer that this cell makes this part every day of the year, but for parts that are kind of of the same architecture and same processes, they all get ganged into this cell. So MRAD receiver, 98B receiver, and the hand guards for the REC series. Mm -hmm all kind of similar construction. They're made from aluminum extrusions that have a similar form. So that's why they all work really well in here. But we want complete control over these parts too. You know, just like the barrel being the heart of the rifle that makes it shoot so well, a lot of the aesthetics and the precision are in these chassis also. Right. And these other, these other major components. So in this cell, we've got, you know, a sawing operation that happens on the extrusions. And then it comes to a couple of boring operations that put the, the big deep hole in, and then two four axis machines that, that do the outside processes. Very cool. The boring happens pretty fast, and that's why we had to have two machines on the four axis side just to keep, keep up. up. Right. right. So it's all about balancing the, the load of throughput for the parts, and that's things that guys a lot smarter than me understand here. Though. <laughs> right. Thank goodness I got them. Me too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is deburr and finishing. This is where we put a lot of the, the hand touches and the final touches on, on the products that make them look really great and function right. Sure. You know, we cannot have burrs on anything that's mechanical. <laughs> he didn't even know that happened. <laughs> we just 
just got wet a little bit. So, uh, yeah, we can't have burrs on any of the parts, you know, for aesthetics, but also for function. So every piece here gets touched in some way. You know, like, here's a bipod screw, a bipod pivot screw. So these are here from the machine. You know, they've got a few sharp edges on them, but not bad. They'll go in this automated blaster where they'll be shot peened and blasted and prepared to be parkerized. And then a larger part, you know, so it ranges everything from a really small part like this to an upper receiver for an M107. So here's a part that's like 36 inches long, sheet metal. It's got a lot of sharp edges. It's been welded on. These guys back here that are truly artists on this gun touch a lot of this by hand with hand sanding tools. But then the whole overall upper receiver gets tumbled in a ceramic media that knocks all those little sharp edges off and makes it smooth. Next, they'll go into the shop blaster also, be shot, shot blasted and clean and parkerized. And then almost everything now is Cerakoted. Yep. So it's it's the prep is so important. Like the attention to detail on Barrett rifles, like when people look at a Barrett rifle, like to me, uh, like an AR-15, they go, wow, that cost whatever percent more yeah. than my, my brand. I'm like, they don't know you like I do, like you as yeah. a shooter, as a gun owner. They don't know you as a manufacturer like I do. They don't know this crew like yeah, I do. Right. And uh, and so I try to educate people on why, you know, what the Barrett difference is. And uh, and it is, it is a company owned by, you're the second generation of shooter here, um, and attention to detail like that is unprecedented. So some of you guys might have a tumbler for your brass. Look at this. This is like the biggest tumbler I've ever seen, and uh, they they tumble various parts in here, and uh, it's just like it's like everything is like supersized here from your home gun shop. Like all the stuff that like their dribble tools are this big here and stuff. It's just uh, <laughs> kind of cool to see uh, the parts turning here and all the machine processes. Uh, this is a tumbler right here. This 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 whole thing. <laughs> it, that's just crazy to me. Like like you you gotta you gotta need you need to tumble a lot of stuff to need a tumbler that big. What's next? Well, more finishing ops. Um, you know, here's some of these guys that I was talking about that are really skilled. All right, Chris, one time I was uh, with you and your dad. Your dad was telling me that the magazine was as hard to create as a gun. That is true. So, yeah. like, tell us about these, these, like, what goes into making that magazine? That is the 82 slash M107 series magazine. That's yeah. That's, yeah, we can grab Can we pull one from there? Please, sir. Thank you. You know, and this mag uh, has been around for several years. It takes years to perfect a magazine. And especially when you talk about in a semi-automatic or automatic gun, rifle it's um it, it, they're so touchy and if the magazine doesn't work the whole system doesn't work and it, it takes a long time and many years of maturing that's why you see on some other magazines like glock mags is one people are really familiar with you see those little revision numbers on your magazine and they're like on revision 42 for this generation well there's a reason why you know it's uh it's one of the most touchy things on any firearm you find little things as you go that's 30 something years of refinement and maturity and what gets mag. me is people act like they buy their glock pistol and that the magazines never wear out. They're like, oh, that's a wear item. You gotta, you gotta yeah. buy new ones every once in a while. But like for you guys that don't understand, and, and not that I do, the ton of engineering, like the, the, the length of this thingy right here, like off by a little bit changes the reliability of the gun. That's just, right. just the curvature. If the curvature isn't right, or and things like that, the, there, there's subtle nuances about a magazine that like, I didn't even understand. I still don't understand, but I didn't even understand the complexity until I started hanging out with you guys. And you guys, oh, no, no. Like, we were talking about something. You said, yeah, they made that take in the AR-15 magazine. That was the smartest thing they could have ever done because it was an existing magazine right. and they're already on the market. Now, I, it was years ago. I remember what gun we were talking about. But, but just hearing um, Chris and his, his father talk about the... the challenges designing a magazine just made me appreciate these things more you know and one of the things that makes me cringe and you've probably seen it too now that we talk about like everything that went into this magazine been working on this magazine for 35 years we are probably on like our 100th spring revision and then aftermarket people make an aftermarket spring for your magazine <laughs> this, uh, we thought it needed to be like heavier uh, you know what goes into these things the testing 
the, the field experience, maybe even more so than in-house testing, that you learned over 35 years, you gotta be really careful. And there's a lot of great aftermarket modifications out there for guns, but you have to consider what like this hive mind here over 35 years has put into refining something to make it work. Yeah. You can't just go swapping stuff. I, I tell know. people that all the time, be careful what pieces you change. Be very careful. Thank you, sorry to get in your way there. Sir. All right, Chris, what we got? Well, this is our Cerakote area. So almost, well, I should say most of the products we make now aren't just finished with a old school parkerizing finish. Like that's not, what the market demands anymore. So almost everything gets some Cerakote final finish. Even our anodized parts on the Rex series or the MRAD series that are anodized and would be a decent functional outside right. surface. We want complete uniformity. I mean, our customers kind of get pretty picky about aesthetics when you're spending that much money. And you want a finish that doesn't have so much dependency on oil right. and, and you want to make as free as possible. So almost everything now gets a final finish of Cerakote. And also gives you a choice of colors yeah. and things like that. And you can even match up somebody's Harley Davidson pretty close. If that's you try right, that's hard. right. We could probably try harder at that. <laughs> but uh, um, so, you know, parkerizing is, you know, the standard mm -hmm. and it's functional and, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. But yeah, the people want more. And, and the thing is, when you get a Barrett rifle, like, it is perfect. You can pick up other rifles, it'll work, they'll be fine, but you can pick up other rifles at a gun shop and you can see imperfections in the finish and different parts. And Barrett goes to so much trouble perfecting their finish and everything on their guns that they put like protective tape where the, the yeah. door opens so while in transit or on the gun shop wall, it doesn't get little dings in it because that stuff is perfect when it leaves this shop and they want it to arrive in the hands of the consumer perfect. So yeah. they even take that much detail to put a little piece of protective tape over the area that might get a scuff uh, during handling. So that shows you their, their attention to detail and the quality of the product they put out. That is a big deal uh, to our civilian customers, a lot of them, but for our military customers yeah, yeah. also, they have uh, a different set of requirements. Like they don't want anything black. You know, most rifles or handguns or any weapon systems going to be filled by military from here on out is most likely not going to be black. It's going to be some type of FDE for the environment we're working in now. So that's why over here we have, you know, these uh, environmentally stabilized, they're basically a drink cooler, you know, that keeps all of these different colors of Cerakote. So every contract gun that we have, uh, you know, different countries will have a color they've specified that matches the other stuff in their arsenal or whatever they're going for. So we, we try to make you know our civilian customers happy with the aesthetics that you're talking about. We're, we're giving our military customers what they want from a functionality standpoint. And uh, keeping everybody happy yeah. is a big job, but yeah, we, yeah. we work on it all the time. Well, it's 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 a, it used to be with the AR-15, like Henry Ford, any color you want, as long well, as you want a black. black. Yeah. Uh, the world is changing, and uh, the, 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 the days of the uh, black rifle <laughs> are numbered. Absolutely. What's next? Let's go over to this field craft. This is something you're probably not too familiar seeing Barrett do, but we built a, Barrett, we built a hunting rifle now. I, I, and you, you showed me an NRA, and when you first said, hey, let me show you my, our hunting rifles, I was thinking, well, we're gonna shoot hogs with the 82A1. Yeah. Or, you know? No, we went, we went uh, purist. We went kind of traditional, but not really. It still has the Barrett DNA, so we're doing a lot of things with this rifle that make it it's a precision rifle, it's a Barrett rifle, but it weighs five pounds. When he, when he told me about these, the way they build these, like if you if you contracted NASA to build a hunting rifle, yeah. this is, I mean, the the alloys and the parts and the pieces and the, the, the specifications, like it was just such a, uh, a departure from what I'm used to hearing about a hunting rifle. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but well, they've they've evolved for so many years from a Mauser style action, you know, sporterized military rifle, to what most Americans think of as a sporting hunting rifle. Now there was so much evolution, nobody had kind of really gone through it on that level yet. So does this look familiar? Oh yeah, <laughs> Maybe we were making those with barrel shells just now. So, and what we're the other thing we're doing here is we are building a rifle. Yeah. It's, that's uh, under five pounds without the guts in it. We are building a rifle that um, is, it absolutely meets the quality standards that you would get on a custom hand-built rifle. And it's gonna hurt some people's feelings, but I'd say it exceeds it. You know, it's a, a difference between a one-off custom hand-built rifle and something productionized to this level is repeatability yep. and quality. Yep. And I, I've owned a lot of custom rifles 
Uh, now there's bespoke, you know, English, London-made rifles that are just really incredible. Maybe I'm not talking about those guys, but but when you get a custom rifle, it's kind of like the first time it's ever been built. Right. You know, it's it hasn't been tested extensively in that configuration. It's that guy's best shot at making one. What we've done here is we wanted that configura configurability, we wanted that quality, but again, we wanted to do it every day right. on, th on this kind of scale. This isn't a lot of rifles sitting here, but every one of these rifles is bedded to its stock. And that is just unheard of. Individually. For, for individually, yeah. And so when you see in this station over here, this lineup of all of these fixtures with clamps, I wish you could see it with the rifles in it. These have already been bedded, but those, all of those stations are filled with rifles with their bedding compounds going. So for, for you guys that don't that maybe don't understand what we're talking about, is there another factory that hand beds like a factory? You, you know, there's a couple of uh, other guns that maybe you would call them semi-custom or semi-production right. that may do this, but I don't think anyone has done it on the scale no, that we have or we're going to or there, we're going to do. There's no way. There's no way. So this is something that you would see at a custom shop, and for it to be in a factory setting is rare. Yeah. Uh, it is, and and certainly, like he said, on this level to this scale, never done before. This is this is fantastic. A, a custom maker might build. 100 rifles like this a year, maybe 200 if they've got some helpers. We're going to build that many in a week. Right. And we're going to sell a rifle that is really worth $4,000 for $17.99 retail. That's what we're going to do. And you know, it's uh, it's what I wanted. I wanted a perfect rifle and I've been really disappointed by some that I've had built before and we're not having that anymore. Right. We're, we're going to let people buy a rifle that's worth four grand and shoots like it for under $1,800. And you know, I don't really think of this as like the value company, right? But we know how to do this, and we're gonna we're gonna kill it. What's funny is what you just heard was Chris say, "I'm building a rifle I wanted." Well, you can do that when you own a manufacturing yeah. company, because I, I, I build classes that I want to take. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if you own a training company, you can do that too. But the thing is. I'm a discerning student, he's a discerning rifleman, and so when, when guys like us get the reins and we can do stuff, everybody benefits from that. That's true. Well, let's head on to the next spot. All right, man. Yep. So what's going on here, Chris? So James, this is where all of the rifles get test fired. So we have um, a 100 meter indoor tunnel here so we can do accuracy testing on every rifle and then we also have on this side we have a, a, a fixture with a bullet trap so when we're just doing proof firing or function firing that doesn't require accuracy shooting we can shoot on this side it's a little crowded in here but we yeah. can run both at once this is a this is one part of the factory that's kind of um, we have really outgrown over yeah. the years so we still demand that every rifle be shot, and, and oddly enough, like a lot of people don't do this, they may think they do, we shoot everything for precision and accuracy. Yeah, right. So everything. Like when you get a Rec 7 SBR, we shot groups with it here. Yep. And that's that's really unheard of, but it's kind of made this a choke point for the factory. We're gonna fix that in the near future, so. But, you know, being that it is a, a choke point, it's still a very valuable tool for us. We have to have it. It uh, Every target is recorded digitally with this Ailer system. So we use paper targets down there, so we have backup and we have to have nice aiming points. Right. But every shot is recorded uh, here on the screen, along Very with cool. velocity for every single shot, velocity at the muzzle and at the target. So we get a lot of data. We try to we try to glean as much informa information from every single shot as we can. Uh, Chris uh, came to our alumni weekend. Of course, he's a type of response alumnus, and he came to alumni weekend one year years ago and did this thing about ammunition, about mm -hmm. all the things that could be wrong with ammo and stuff like that. And uh, I think some people were wondering like how you might know something like that, but you got <laughs> this laboratory and yeah. you know, plus the rest of the shooting you do. Uh, like this dude knows more about a brass empty brass case of ammunition. Like he's like Quincy man. Like you can find a piece and he can tell you all <laughs> kinds of stuff about that thing. It's it's amazing. But uh, this. this this whole this whole setup, as you said, they've outgrown it. But man, there's so many guns have come through here, yes. and there's so many so many stories from this place. And and uh, man, it's just it's amazing to, to be in here. The whole factory is cool, but like this is the this is the one place where it's just like you know these things are born here. Like, That's right. This the, the you know, embryonic stage out there, and right here is where they're born. So it's really cool. It's really cool. So earlier I was talking about like the protective tape that they put on these these guns. To ensure that they don't get nicks or things like that uh, on their way to on the way to the consumer, and it just shows you the 
the, the level of care that they take in ensuring that the absolute best product gets to the consumer. It's just, I've never seen this attention to detail uh, ever before in any firearms manufacturing plant I've ever been in. This is probably my favorite section, Chris. This is where the fun stuff happens. This is the, uh, the rack assembly cell. So the REC series, they're all assembled here. And this is a little departure from the old way that Barrett rifles have traditionally been built on a bench. You know, when we were lower volume with the 82A1, as, as you know, some of the only products we had, they're kind of built over here on benches with multi-purpose tools out on the table. You grab what tools you need for the job. As we moved into rifles like the, the Rec 7 series and things like Philcraft, we see that you know the processes look quite a bit different when you're building that volume. So all of these fixtures and tools here are purpose built, purpose designed for these processes to build these rifles. So we don't have so many workbenches with toolboxes. We have you know right. assembly jigs with tools right here at the point of use. Yep. And the the uh, inventory, the parts that build the rifles are rolled in right to the point of use. So it's uh, it's really fun to build a rifle here. It's yeah. efficient and it the quality that we get from having everything so visual and at arm's length means that the wrong tool is never used. Right. You know, the right tool crunches are there for the job. And it just, uh, it, it's part of another reason why we can turn out a rifle like that. And um, you guys have heard me talk about before, but I have a, a special fondness for the Rec Series of rifles mm -hmm. because I was around when Chris first came out with them. I was honored to be handed one to the mm -hmm. prototype gun to go do some you know we put a bunch of rounds through it really fast. I think you guys put 22,000 rounds in, through one of the original 556 Rex 7s. In, in uh, 28 days. Wow. Yeah and um, so it, the, the gun you know just for me being around when it was conceived and stuff like that I actually um, texted Chris and told him I'd, I'd burn his fucking house down if I didn't get the first one but uh, we're still friends and <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's just it's, it's it's great for me to see now the second generation mm -hmm. and the the uh, what I thought was already a fantastic gun is even better now Thank and you. Uh, you guys have done a, a remarkable job I, I wouldn't even have told you from that prototype gun you know we had you asked me what else what else what else mm -hmm. and I was like I, Chris I can't I don't have anything to tell mm -hmm. you and so but <laughs> but you've done it anyway. You've made the, the gun better anyway, and it's just amazing to see. And, and again, like I said, for, for, of, of everything that you guys do, this is the one that like I, I kind of feel the most kinship oh, with. Oh yeah. And uh, and so uh, I'm just uh, I'm real proud of what you guys have done with these guns, and and uh, and I love the ones I have. You know, Thank they're awesome. You. I, I never thought we would have been here. You know, coming from uh, being the 50 caliber rifle company, and still most people only yeah. know us as that. Yeah. Sometimes we have a marketing challenge convincing people that we make anything else besides that 50 caliber rifle. Right. It's not the worst problem to have. <laughs> but I never thought we would be here. Right. And you know, I, I just realized that the rifle you're holding in your hand is actually a contract rifle. This is a 300 Blackout SBR. Uh, this is the semi-auto version. This particular customer bought semis and select fire. So um, yeah, we're now, we, we now have a product line that evolved from those early days of you testing that and wringing the thing out, which we learned a lot from, to it is uh, now being filled by some of the most demanding customers in the world. And and for us to, to have dad's rifles, the, the 82 series, the 95, even my Model 99 has been adopted by US his, military. His, his gun. Yeah, and the MRAD. I mean, we, we probably have more rifles that have been adopted by US military. Like some companies have like one product in their line. Mm -hmm. but I think everything besides our Fieldcraft rifle and the shotgun line that we have of sporting shotguns is in military use somewhere. And for us, that's a great honor, but it's it's a great responsibility. Yep. And it's part, of, it's part of the reason why we build rifles that run, why we put so much thought into them, and, and why we care so much about it, because we know where they go. It absolutely shows. With, with every single product, every single screw, it, the, the, the attention to details, detail absolutely shows. So we are in the advanced research lab here at Barrett Firearms. We're gonna talk about gun design. That's no small thing. And a lot of cool guns have been designed in this area that we're in here. So let's talk about that, Chris. What What's some of the things you consider when you're gonna design them? You know, a lot, a lot. A lot of feedback from military users from, you know, because they're the toughest on these things. But it's, uh, I think that what really makes us different is where we've got our process down on design now. We've, uh, we're in the advanced research group, and the reason I call it that, and not R&D, 
is I broke the research away from the D. You know, D is development, and development is a thing that companies do to make money. You have to develop new products to bring them out. Research should not be tethered with that. Research is for dreaming, yep. and that's why we call this the Advanced Research Group. I want these guys over here to consider problems that customers have and consider solutions to fix them. And, and you know, they can't be tethered down with, well, what's going to be profitable? You know, and what, do, what product do we need for 2018 to respond to the market? So we have this advanced research group and they're able to, to really dream big and, and think outside of the box, I hate to use that term again, but, yeah. it's, uh, but it's just the truth. So things that we consider is absolutely at the forefront is reliability. You know, if it doesn't work all the time, you die. I mean, you can right, die. Right. So it doesn't. It doesn't matter how great the groups are, or how light it is, or how pretty it looks. If it doesn't work first, so reliability is paramount. We uh, we kind of overdesign some things for for reliability and ruggedness, and you know, and, and longevity. But then for us, really, you know, lately our mission is not lately. Our mission is accuracy after reliability. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that when you talk when pe when people talk about Barrett firearms, doesn't matter which model. Like they think quality, they mm -hmm. think they think top of the line, mm -hmm. you know, quality and performance and reliability, and then that that is something I don't know if you've tried to make that your uh, build that into your brand, but it certainly is your brand. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then because you build precision rifles, you know, the eighty two A one and things like that, the longer range stuff, then the the accuracy has to come into play, of course, and I agree with you but not at the at the sacrifice of reliability mm -hmm. and because because your dad and you and the whole family are shooters you guys get that on a on a fundamental level and and i keep bringing it up but as you know that's something that's missing from americans firearm american mm -hmm. firearms development and corporations is shooters yeah and so so please continue accuracy yeah it, it's um you're right. We have we have high standards on these things, and we, um, you know, kind of as you saw going through the plant, like we really we paint the back of the fence, like which means we do things that some people will never even know about or see for us, and there's just things that we won't tolerate anymore either. And a rifle that does not perform the way I expect it to, every time I take it out, I, I, I actually get rid of them. I just won't even keep them. And, and so, you know, I've been through a lot of things like that. I own this big gun store up here. I've been a shooter all my life. I've been in contact with a lot of different firearms. And, you know, there are a few out there, and everybody has one, like this faithful rifle, whether it's your granddad's hunting rifle or that carbine you use every weekend that always answers when you call. It does exactly what you expect it to do. But the, the truth is, like, a lot of, um, a lot of guns don't. And right. you know they've they've really become some of them have become almost like a a commoditized consumer product that are you know built for profit and built to respond to you know some market trend and that's not what we do here you know we we would build rifles that we want to shoot mm -hmm. that that do exactly what we ask them to so when I point this MRAD at a target at 1,000 yards and I have the proper data for the cartridge I'm shooting I demand that when that trigger is pulled that 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 plate is struck. Period. And like the first time a rifle or the second time it doesn't, like you're done with it. Like whether you know it or not, in your heart, you're like, ugh. Like it's always in the back of your head and, and, and you can't have that. You can't have that with a firearm or, or a car. You know, that, that car better stop when you hit the brakes. Right. If it doesn't a few times, chances are <laughs> like, you're yeah. gonna have a serious, uh, you're gonna have a serious head and heart problem with yeah. that car. So, you know, it's, it's really the same way with our rifles. Um, we demand a lot of them. They have to work 100% of the time. They have to do what you expect them to do, which means they telegraph a bullet to where your brain thinks it should be. And when you have a rifle like that, it's it's awesome. Well, here's what's funny: as as we as we film this, the uh, there's a there's a fire sale on AR-15s. You know, like the the, the yeah. industry's down, and um, p people are like, ah, oh, you can get this this one AR-15 for $500. Uh, it used to be a thousand, mm. and I, what I tell them was, what I tell them is, it was always a five hundred dollar AR-15. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just now that's what it costs. It, w it never was worth that. And so I try to tell people when they when they look at a Barrett rifle, I've been to a lot of factories, and and yeah, to reiterate, 
the, the level of care and attention to detail that goes into a Barrett rifle is unmatched in the firearms mm -hmm. industry. Thank you, Travis. I mean, may, maybe maybe if I went to Rolex or Breitling mm -hmm. or something and watched them to watch together, maybe I would see that. But um, but you've been around and you won't toot your own horn. I don't mind. But um, but I'm telling you, I've never seen any any level of commitment to building a reliable, accurate rifle. I've never seen that level of commitment anywhere I've ever been in my life. Man, thank you. It means a lot to us. And uh, so, why is my all shoot low left? <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be the <laughs> uh, I, I say that all the time. People go, "Oh, this gun's no good. It's all it shoots left." But, uh, but no, it's 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 been fun. And um, I think this is a good place to kind of wrap the video yeah. up. Um, Chris, thanks a bunch. You, as you guys know, full, full disclosure, Chris is my friend, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I want you guys to know who Chris is. I want you guys to know who, who this company is. This won't be the last time we'll be here, uh, Chris. We're going to do some other stuff together and and um, uh, try to try to let you guys really get to know who Barrett, not just Chris, but who Barrett is and what this company is about. And uh, we were out there earlier, and uh, Chris ran into an employee that he had never met before. And he told me about how he felt bad about that. He just said, things are busy, we've hired people. And he says, you know, I remember a day when I knew every single person here. And that's the kind of guy he is, that he actually vocalized to me that he felt bad that he was meeting a guy for the first time out there on the floor. That just shows you what kind of person he is, it shows you what kind of friend he is, or employer he is, and, and uh, what kind of man he is that like, like he wants, he wants everybody in this building to do well, and he and he and he tries to figure out what it's going to take to make that happen. So, it's not they're not just building rifles here. I mean, he, he's built a family here. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that. Like you're <laughs> you let me cry. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, James. Um, but uh, but uh, let's see if you got questions. If something you want to see next time, post it below the video. Thanks, Chris. Thank he, you, he's, a, he's a busy man, huh. and uh, for him to take time out like this for you guys and for me is is a big deal. But uh, we'll just remind you that your responsibility to be ready for the fight never ends.